In this video, I will be making dibento AE cyclooctene, which is a strong binding ligand for transition metal ions. Its complexes show interesting properties for catalysis, but applications are quite limited, since it has been poorly accessible. In recent years, there have been developments in synthesizing this ligand on a multigram scale. So for this video, I will be following the whole procedure to synthesize this ligand. For the first step, I will have to brominate the methyl groups of O-xylene, as it is one of the reagents in this synthesis. So to get started, I set up a heating mantle and a 3-neck flask. I drop in a stir bar, and then attach a dropping funnel on the left and a condenser in the middle. Now to the top of the condenser, I attach the gas adapter with a hose that leads to a gas washing bottle, containing a saturated solution of sodium thiosulfate. This will neutralize any bromine vapors that escape. Now to the flask, I add in 86 ml of O xylene and then attach a thermometer that reaches into the xylene. I start heating the xylene to a reflux and then to the dropping funnel I add in 254 grams of freshly prepared bromine. A little bit went into the arm of the dropping funnel and into the flask, but this doesn't really matter for this reaction. Now I open the dropping funnel and start adding the bromine dropwise to the boiling hot xylene. I also set up a strong lamp nearby to illuminate the setup because the light will hit the bromine and produce two radicals that will react with the xylene. So what will happen is the light will assist in producing bromine radicals. When hit by a photon, bromine will fall apart and produce two radicals. These radicals can steal a hydrogen atom from the xylene methyl groups, which in turn allows for another bromine radical to attach itself there. This produces a monobrominated xylene and hydrobromic acid. This process then repeats itself on the other methyl group to produce the dibromide. The bromine vaporizes easily because of the heat, but it seems to also react with xylene in the gas phase, so it's not really a problem. Now when the temperature is too low, the bromine won't react, so it's important that the xylene keeps boiling. When it is brought to a boil, we can see the bromine disappear again, and I can start adding more. When all of the bromine has been added, I leave it to boil for 30 more minutes. When that is done, I allow the mixture to cool down to 60 C. And when that temperature is reached, I removed all of the adapters. And we can see a bunch of HBr vapors escaping. Now I pour all of the mixture into 80 ml of boiling hexanes, in which the dibromide is less soluble. I wash the flask twice with some more hexanes to get everything out, and then allow the mixture to slowly cool back down to room temperature, which will crystallize out the dibromide. Afterward, I put it in the fridge to cool it down further, and then filter it all through a glass fitted filter with vacuum filtration. The liquid simply pours out, but there's a bunch of black crystals that are stuck. I washed it twice with some cold hexanes to get it to come loose, and then stabbed it repeatedly with a spoon to get everything to come out. I then wash it again with some more hexanes, and crush the fragile crystals with a spoon and press it onto the filter. I leave it to dry on the filter for about 20 minutes, and then take it off. Now I pour all of the contents into a crystallizing dish, and we can see we have a little under 100 grams of crude product. This gives a yield of 52%, which is the same as the procedure I was following. The product still contains various impurities, since the pure product should be more leaning towards white, which is obviously not the case. Now I set the crystallizing dish onto a hot plate and add 300 ml of 95% ethanol. I add a stir bar and then start heating the dish. I bring it to a boil and move the dish around to dissolve as much of the solid as possible. While boiling hot, I quickly filter the solution through a cotton plug inside a large plastic funnel. We can see that still a decent bit of product didn't dissolve. We can see that the decrease in temperature from filtering the mixture made a lot of product crystallize out. I set it on a cork ring to cool it down further and wait until it reaches room temperature. After that, I set it inside the freezer at minus 26 C for 20 minutes. I also take the remaining solid that was left in the crystallizing dish and repeat the same process. When all of that is done, I took the dish out of the freezer, decanted the liquid, and we are left with a bunch of brown crystals. A bunch of the same crystals also appeared in the beaker in which I did the second crystallization. I destroyed the fragile wet crystals in the beaker with a spoon and combined them with the crystals in the dish. Now I move all of the mushy crystals to a glass fitted filter and dry it on the filter with the vacuum pump running. I press it onto the filter and leave it to dry for an hour. After that, it seems dry and it kind of looks and feels like sand. Now I took out the filter and poured it all into a crystallizing dish to weigh it. So it looks like we have 52 grams of product here. So the recovery of the more purified product is 52%. 
which is lower than the 80 to 85% mentioned in the procedure. Now that I have the dibrominated silene, I can continue with the next reaction. So I set up a heating mantle and a 3 neck flask. Then I attach a dropping funnel and a condenser, and on top of the dropping funnel I add a gas adapter and connect an argon line. I purge the apparatus with argon, and remove moisture by heating the glass with a torch. Under argon flow, I add 110 ml of dry degas THF. On top of that, I add 4.1 grams of lithium pieces. I then attach a thermometer adapter and remove the argon flow. Now I have dissolved all of the dibromide in 150 ml of THF and put it into the dropping funnel. I close off the dropping funnel with a stopper and now start adding the solution dropwise to the lithium suspension in the flask. What is happening is a lithium halogen exchange, similar to the Woods reaction. In the full reaction, two dibrominated silenes can react in the presence of lithium to form a double coupled product. At first, the lithium will pick up a bromine to form lithium bromide, which leaves a radical on that carbon. Two of these radicals can react to form an intermediate coupled product. This intermediate can undergo the same reaction with lithium. When both bromines are removed and there are two radicals present on the intermediate molecule, it can cyclicize into a cyclooctane and form the final product. Though this is not all that is happening. Either in multiple steps or at once, depending on where the radical forms and when it reacts, the intermediate molecule can also react with another uncoupled radical and form the triple coupled product. So I added the solution during 1.5 hours and afterwards let the mixture reflux overnight to make sure everything reacts. When that is done, I take it off heat and we can see most of the lithium has reacted away. To remove the remaining lithium pieces, I filter the mixture with vacuum filtration into another flask. I then wash the flask and the pieces on the filter with some THF. After that, I remove the filter and discard the lithium pieces and set the solution up for a short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the THF. I wait until no more THF comes over. After that, I am left with a thick dark liquid and some pink THF as distillate. Now that all of the THF is gone, I can remove the lithium bromide that has formed during the reaction. Since lithium bromide is soluble in THF, I had to remove all of it. Now I can add a solvent in which the product is soluble but lithium bromide is not. So to the flask, I add 500 ml of DCM and start stirring. We can immediately see lithium bromide is suspended in the mixture, but the particle size is so extremely small that it has to be filtered more intensively. So I set up a glass filter and packed some sea light on top to get out the larger particles first. I then turn on the vacuum and filter all of the mixture through. I wash it with some DCM and we can see that the filter still has lithium bromide particles due to its cloudiness. So it has to be filtered through an even finer filter material. So I remove the filter and clean it out and then repeat the same process. But this time I pack the filter with a layer of silica gel. I filter it all through, wash it with some DCM and the mixture has cleaned up a bit but it's still not completely clear. I filter it again through the same filter two more times, so that all the particles get removed. Now after having it filtered once through the sea light and three times through the silica gel, it has completely cleared up and all the lithium bromide has been removed. Now to dry the DCM, I add in a bunch of sodium sulfate and stir it for a few minutes. Now I filter it again to remove all of the sodium sulfate and set it up for a short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the DCM. I leave it overnight and when that is done, I am left with a thick brown solid that melts at higher temperatures. And some white crystals that have appeared on the sides of the flask. Since it is pretty much impossible to properly remove the crystals or remove the brown solid cleanly, I will have to try to purify it while keeping it in here. So as we have seen, even at the relatively low temperatures that the DCM was boiled off with, the solid still managed to sublime and collect on the sides of the flask. In the procedure, they use a Kugelrohr distillation. Since I don't have the equipment for that, and I think it is quite unnecessary with these properties, I will do a vacuum sublimation. So I attach an adapter with a cold finger into the middle neck, which is basically just a glass stick with water running through. This will keep it cold, and the sublimed product will deposit it onto it. Since the flask is quite large, and the mantle will only heat the bottom half, I have to heat the rest of the glass so that the product won't deposit on the sides of the glass. If the glass is too cold, crystals will deposit on that spot, but they can simply be melted off with the heat gun. We can see white crystals growing on the cold finger, and I leave it running for a while so that most of it can deposit. I insulate the flask with some aluminum foil and continuously blast at the front with a heat gun. This seemed to keep the crystals from depositing on the flask. After a while, a lot has deposited on the cold finger, so I will take it out before it becomes too much, and simply run it again afterward. 
so I removed all of the hosing and carefully take out the cold finger, so that the crystals don't fall off. Now I scrape off all of the crystals and collect them in a crystallizing dish. Now I have run the vacuum sublimation two more times, and afterward I am left with 6.77 grams of white crystals. Now that I have the pure and fresh product, I can move on with the next step. So I set up a heating mantle and a flask, in which I have put all of the product. I then attach a gas adapter with an argon line, a condenser, and a funnel. Through the funnel, I add in 100 ml of carbon tetrachloride, and start stirring to dissolve the crystals. On top of that, I add in 12.2 grams of n bromosacinamide, which is the brominating agent for this reaction. Then I remove the funnel and replace it with a stopper. I start heating the mixture to a reflux and remove the argon line. I then leave it to reflux for 3 hours. During this reaction, the NBS will brominate the cyclooctane part of the molecule once on each side. When NBS is suspended in carbon tetrachloride, the NBS reacts with trace amounts of HBr that the NBS contains as an impurity, to produce a low enough concentration of bromine to facilitate the reaction. When I come back, the reaction mixture has turned more orange and the reaction should be finished. Now to remove the form to cinnamide, I will filter it through a glass filter. I then wash the filter with some more carbon tetrachloride. Now to get the product, I boil off all of the carbon tet with short path vacuum distillation. When that is done, I am left with a yellow solid at the bottom of the flask. I scrape the solid from the bottom and then pour it onto a glass filter. I then wash it several times with some water and try to crush the pieces a bit with a spatula. After having washed the product, I transferred it all to a flask fitted with a gas adapter. Now to remove any remaining water, I dry the product on a strong vacuum at 30C overnight. When I come back, the product looks a lot more dry and has also turned a lot more white. Now that I have the dry product, I can move on with the final synthesis. So to the flask with the product, I add in 75 ml of THF. I stir the mixture so that all of the product dissolves and then set it aside. Now I set up a new flask with a stir bar and add in 40 ml of THF. I start stirring and add in 13 grams of potassium dirt butoxide. I wait for it all to dissolve and then move the flask to an ice salt water bath. I attach a dropping funnel on top and pour in the THF solution of the product. I wash the flask once with some THF and then start adding the product solution to the copio solution. The reaction mixture quickly changes color and gradually becomes darker. When the addition is complete, I remove the dropping funnel and the ice salt water bath. I then leave it to stir for 3 hours at room temperature to allow the reaction to complete. During this reaction, the copio will react with the brominated product to form the final product containing the double bonds. To explain this reaction requires a bit more detail. Since copio is an extremely strong base, it can take up a hydrogen easily. The third butoxide will steal a hydrogen from the carbon adjacent to the carbon the bromine is attached to and become third butanol. This causes the electrons that originally formed the bond with the hydrogen to move and form a double bond instead. Now this causes the carbon the bromine is attached to to have five bonds, which is not possible. So since bromine is a good leaving group, it will gladly take its bond electrons and leave to bind with the remaining potassium ion instead. And after that, balance has been restored. But there's still some more cotbu, so this will happen again on the other side of the molecule, which will form the final product. So after it has been stirring for 3 hours at room temperature, the reaction should be complete. I then set up a glass filter with a layer of silica gel on top, which I wet with some diethyl ether. I then pour in the whole reaction mixture and let it all filter through. I wash the silica with more ether to get out all of the product. When that is done, I dry the ether with sodium sulfate, filter it again and then set it up for a short path vacuum distillation to boil off all of the solvent, which is a mixture of ether and THF. When that was done, I put it in the freezer to make sure everything crystallized out and wasn't super cooling and I was left with a yellow orange solid. I poke at it a bit and it breaks easily. Now for the final step, I transferred all of the solid with the stir bar to another flask and attached a cold finger and a vacuum adapter. Now I will attempt the exact same thing as earlier in the video, but now with the final product. So I pull a vacuum and start heating and stirring. After a while we can see crystals are starting to form on the cold finger. 
there was also some other impurity present, which started refluxing in the flask. Though it will likely continue to be present as an impurity because of this, it seems like it doesn't wash away the crystals or interfere with the deposition. So after it is done, I scraped all the crystals off and I am left with 2.5 grams of dibenzo AE cyclooctene, which is a yield of 38% compared to the first product. 